Welcome into another episode of Locked On Phillies. In today's episode, we've got six days till opening day, and there are some major questions about a Philadelphia Phillies pitcher. What's going on with Taiwan Walker? And has it been kind of overshadowed by the center field competition? Speaking of that, we're going to answer some questions from the listeners in Mailbag Friday. Yes, I'm finally getting to the mailbag questions. And like I said, six days till opening day. I think you can all guess who the best number six was in Philadelphia Phillies history. Was there maybe someone better than the guy you're thinking of? We'll break it all down on today's episode of Locked On Phillies. You are Locked On Phillies, your daily Philadelphia Phillies podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, this is Locked On Phillies. I'm Connor Thomas, your host. Thank you so much for checking us out. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Please make sure you're rating, reviewing, subscribing to the YouTube, all that great stuff that really helps us out here on Locked On Phillies. I really, really appreciate it. Opening day right around the corner. So yesterday we had our NL East roundtable where we talked about with all the other hosts from the NLE, so so lock on Braves, Mets, Marlins, and Nationals, what we think the division is going to do this year. You can go ahead and check that out on uh, on YouTube. It's our most recent episode before this one that you're watching. So hope you enjoyed that one. Now back to our regularly scheduled programming, though, with yours truly. And there's something that I think Phillies fans might be overlooking a little bit. It's become a bit of a headline in the past couple days. But Taiwan Walker has been struggling this spring, right? Matt Gelb put out a tweet yesterday, and I'll, I'll read you this tweet, and I'll also tell you about an article. Matt Gelb of The Athletic, who covers the Phillies. And the tweet says, for what it's worth, the Phillies botched a routine double play and then another grounder before Taiwan Walker allowed two homers. He sat 88 to 91 miles per hour in the first inning. He was behind in many counts. Uh That's from two days ago. That is not a good sign. And he also, Matt Gelb, wrote an article uh, about Taiwan Walker and Ranger Suarez having divergent springs. What does that mean? Well, the word divergent obviously means one heading in one direction, one heading in the other. But in this instance, what Matt Gelb is talking about, Ranger Suarez has been lights out, unbelievable, unstoppable in spring training. He looks awesome when usually... Ranger Suarez is a guy that in spring training has a visa issue, has an injury, has an illness, goes to the World Baseball Classic and gets forearm tightness, like doesn't start the regular season on time. That's been Ranger Suarez's big issue. Tywin Walker has been really dependable in his career coming out of spring training and being ready to go. And this year, it seems that the snake bittenness that Ranger Suarez has dealt with the past two, three years is now transferred over to Tywin Walker almost, which... It's not great. The whole, like, let's break down these problems, right? Because there's no easy way to say it, but Tywin Walker has stunk this spring. The first thing that we need to understand, right, the very first thing that we always talk about with spring training, ultimately these games don't matter, right? Ultimately, Tywin Walker could go out and give up a home run every single at bat in clear water and still have a fine year at the major league level. Tywin Walker's in no no danger of losing his spot in the rotation. He's just not. And for all you people who are like, oh, the Phillies should have added more pitching. Uh, Major League Baseball, we talked about their power rankings in our last solo episode. They also just put out their rankings for rotations in baseball who have the best rotations. And the Philadelphia Phillies were third, trailing only the Seattle Mariners and the Atlanta Braves. So, yeah, I'd say the Phillies have enough pitching, and I'd say the guys that they have are good enough. But it's concerning that Tywin Walker has had a velocity dip. That's the part that's most important in all this, not the fact that he's given up home runs or that he hasn't looked that sharp in spring training. That could always just be somebody working on new pitches, working on something we're not aware of. Here's the issue with Tywin Walker. The velocity drop is normally a sign that there is something wrong health-wise or there's something wrong preparation-wise. Neither of those are good with six days till opening day. Like Those are both major potential issues. And I lean that it's the former, that it's 
health wise, because remember he had knee soreness that shut him down for a little bit earlier in the spring. A couple of weeks ago, it was reported he had regular spring training knee soreness. I don't know what that means exactly. We talked about it when that report came out. I wasn't too concerned about it then. I'm not overly concerned about it now, but when I see the velocity down, this is not a, oh, is Taiwan Walker going to stink this year conversation? This is a, is Taiwan Walker not going to be ready for the regular season type conversation? He'll work into it. I don't think he'll be like bad all year. I just wonder how far away he is from the guy he wants to be when he takes the mound for the first time in the regular season. You add on to that that Christopher Sanchez has not exactly had an outstanding spring himself, right? Now, he's young. He's working on stuff, but he hasn't looked amazing. And Aaron Nola is expecting the birth of a child. Uh, due date April 4th, I believe it is, for him and his wife. So hmm, one guy in Tom Walker doesn't seem ready to pitch at the major league level right now. He'll get there, but he's just not. He's behind the eight ball. Christopher Sanchez has been a little bit rough. Aaron Nola might not be available for a couple of days. So this first like week and a half stretch of the season is going to be very, very interesting. This is not panic button time at all. It's spring training. These guys could go out and be lights out. And you could be totally fine. But it's something to keep an eye on. And here's why it's so important that Taiwan Walker is not ill-prepared or injured. Because he's your innings eater. He is. When the postseason comes along, the main goal for Zach Wheeler, if the Phillies are going to be a postseason team, is to be healthy when the Phillies get there. The main goal for Aaron Nola is to be healthy when the Phillies get there. The main goal for Ranger Suarez is the same as those other two guys. Be healthy when the Phillies get there. And you know what the goal for Taiwan Walker is? The same as it was last year. Eat up a bunch of innings to make sure that those guys – are able to make it to the postseason healthy. Take stuff off of their plate. Last year, he did an outstanding job. 15 wins, ate up a lot, 172 and two-thirds innings pitched. He did a really good job last year of being that steadying, calming presence in the Philadelphia Phillies rotation to say, I'm going to go get a six or seven innings today every single time, win or lose, just because I'm going to go battle. And if you're throwing 88 miles an hour with a fastball, you are not going to be that guy. That's just, it's not going to be possible for him to drop velocity like that and continue to eat up innings for the Philadelphia Phillies. So that's why he's so important. Christopher Sanchez will figure it out. I'm not worried about him. I am slightly worried about Tywin Walker. But again, the thing I keep coming back to is that voice in the back of my head that says spring training, spring training. Once the actual game starts, that's when you begin to fully evaluate if we have a problem or not. So something to keep an eye on with the Philadelphia Phillies rotation. I think they're incredibly talented. I think they're going to be just fine. And you think about all the guys that you could have pitch in case something goes wrong. Mick Abel has had a really nice spring. He's not going to start the year with the team, but he's had a nice spring. If you need an emergency guy, he could be an emergency guy. Spencer Turnbull. Um, Colby Allard, those are guys that you look at and you say, okay, they were brought in because they have major league level pitching experience. David Buchanan, like these are all guys that could, if Tywin Walker is not ready, if Christopher Sanchez is not ready, if Aaron Nola uh, misses a start because he's welcoming the birth of a child, like that's when you go to these guys that you acquired this offseason. That's why you have them. So the Phillies actually have some pretty solid pitching depth too of guys that are going to start in AAA Lehigh. So Again, it's not a worry about the team. And it's not even a huge worry about Taiwan Walker because ultimately I think this rotation is still incredibly strong. But if Taiwan Walker struggles early on in the season, you're going to start to hear the narrative that this guy is in for a rough 2024. And one of your top five pitchers in for a rough 2024 is not a recipe for success at the level where you can compete with teams like Atlanta and LA. Like you just won't be on the same tier win total. The Phillies need to have like an outstanding season from a lot of guys mm -hmm. to get to the 95 plus win mark and put themselves in contention for the NL East. 
And that means the starting pitching has to be on point like it was last year. And this year, we'll see. But coming out of spring training, it's far from a sure thing that they're just going to roll back in and do that. It makes it interesting. It doesn't make it fun. It'd be a lot more fun if they were all great. But that's what we have to deal with. And that's what we'll keep an eye on as we draw closer to opening day. I believe Tywin Walker will throw one more time before he makes his regular season debut. So we'll keep an eye out for that next time he toes the rubber in spring training and see if anything changes velocity wise coming up next we're going to get into uh mailbag <laughs> it's mailbag friday now sorry there have been so many things with opening day coming up next week that i wanted to get to that uh, i haven't gotten to your guys questions yet so we're going to get to a couple from listeners coming up on the other side and uh, a couple that are very interesting questions i haven't touched on as much as i would have liked so we're going to dive into that coming up as we continue locked on phillies Let's talk about my guys over at FanDuel, though, because you can say goodbye to busted brackets. FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. My bracket's already dead. I lost two Elite Eight teams on the first day. My goodness, am I bad at this. But you know what? doesn't matter. I can still bet with FanDuel. I can still put money on teams, even if I didn't pick them in my original bracket. So whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sportsbook. Right now... New customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. You got a one seed playing a 16 seed, but $5 on the one seed. Normally, that would pay out like, I don't know, $2. But you get $200 this time with FanDuel's new customer bonus. So go ahead and check it out, and you can use that extra money on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Let's answer some questions from the audience, shall we? Let's go ahead and run through what I was tweeted at. So I go ahead, went ahead and put a tweet out. And just like always, you guys are great with the responses. So I'm going to pick a couple to go through here. Uh, and this is kind of building on the conversation we just had. So I want to start with this one. It comes from Tim Moore at Tim Moore 4289 on Twitter. And Tim asks, Ranger Suarez. Over or under a 2.85 ERA this year? I think he's going to have a phenomenal year. And I'll tell you what, Tim. I think he's going to have a phenomenal year as well. But 2.85, that's phenomenal. Now, remember, Ranger Suarez has had a season where he threw just over 100 innings and he had a sub-2 ERA. That's what first Ranger Suarez on the scene is. This kid is going to be something. And then he's had injuries and slow starts to the season and some struggles and hasn't gotten quite back to that. So the fact that he did that in over 100 innings says, like a sub-2 ERA, says 285 should be no problem if he's at his best. But he's been in the high threes, low fours the past couple of years. So, hmm, 285 over under. I'll tell you what, I'm going to take the over for Ranger Suarez, but not by much. Here's what I'll say. I think there's a solid chance that he has a higher than 285 ERA, but a lower than a 315. I think Tim is asking right kind of in that zone. Now, I can't say like Ranger Suarez is going to have a 284 ERA or better being the third best pitcher on this rotation with the good teams you got to play and stuff like that. The NL East may be a little bit more competitive with – the Mets making some changes this offseason. I, I don't know. We'll see how competitive the division is. And we talk about that in our crossover and at least roundtable episode that we recorded yesterday and dropped yesterday. Well, we recorded a couple weeks ago, but dropped yesterday. Bottom line is I don't want to jump the gun and be like, ah, Ranger Suarez, great spring. He's going to have a 1-5 ERA. I'm still trying to be realistic about this, but I think it's a great line by Tim. I'm going to take the over, but not by too much. There's a chance that Ranger Suarez is in a situation where he starts to get notice for Cy Young consideration. It's going to be hard to get votes on a team that also has Zach Wheeler and Aaron Nola in the rotation, but that's something you'll be looking at. Another juicy nugget on Ranger Suarez, he's healthy going into the season. And if he stays that way, he's going to be heavily 
in contention for a gold glove. The guy is an outstanding defensive pitcher. He always has been since he started playing with the Philadelphia Phillies. And the problem the past couple of years is just hasn't played enough to qualify for it. So that's something I'm looking at this year, too. In addition to the ERA, does Ranger Suarez pitch enough? Does he play enough to consider get consideration, I should say, for a gold glove? That would be awesome. Zach Wheeler is the reigning National League gold glove winner at pitcher. Could you imagine if they keep it in-house and Ranger Suarez wins it this year? That would make you feel pretty darn good about the um, the defense that you have on the mound for the Philadelphia Phillies. So great question from Tim. Great line at 2.85 ERA for Ranger Suarez. I'm taking the over, but not by much. And um, let's go to our next question here, because speaking of awards, Chris Gress at Christopher GRE3 on Twitter asks about another award. If Bryce Harper is fully healthy and plays the majority of the season, what are your thoughts on him winning another MVP? Here's a tough thing with that. The National League is stacked with potential MVP candidates. I mean, LA has three of them on the same team. Uh, the, the Atlanta Braves have two of them on the same team. The Philadelphia Phillies might have two of them on the same team. And then you just kind of have those odd guys out there that could be difference makers for some teams that aren't going to be completely in contention. But could Bryce Harper, with a full healthy season, plays the majority of the season, win an MVP this year? Absolutely. Now, Ronald Acuna is unbelievable. You're going to have to beat out Acuna. Matt Olson is unbelievable. You're going to have to beat out Matt Olson. You're going to have to beat the Dodgers three-headed monster of Freddie Freeman, Mookie Betts, Shohei Otani. Though Shohei Otani in some hot water right now. I guess I'll take the time to talk about this now with Shohei Otani having his interpreter steal like $4.5 million from him and all these underground gambling transactions and everything that are being linked back to his name. That is a major issue for baseball. That is something that we may have to talk more about. Like, it's not Phillies related. So, with opening day right around the corner, I don't want to talk to you about some guy on the Dodgers who's getting in trouble, even if it is Shohei Otani. Uh, we got our own stuff to focus on. That doesn't help the Phillies win games. But if there begins to look like there's going to be some discipline against Otani, we'll have to get into that. It also makes the MVP conversation a lot easier for Bryce Harper if Otani is, for whatever reason, not playing. But that's not what you're rooting for. You're not rooting for guys to be unable to play. We're rooting for just Bryce Harper to be better than all of them. And I honestly look at Bryce Harper and I say, at his best, could he still be the best player in baseball? Well, let's start with his defense. There is belief that he has the ceiling of a gold glove winner at first base. Like, that is his defensive ceiling, according to some. Will he ever reach that? We don't know. But if he's a gold glove caliber defender at first base, that's already a step in the right direction. The power numbers came back at the end of last year as he settled in, and they came back in the postseason. So can he hit enough home runs, say, I don't know, 37 to 40-plus home runs in order to win that award, the MVP? Yes. And if he hits something around 40 home runs – he's probably going to also have to hit over 300 in order to keep up with the immense talent that's in the National League. He's proven that he can do that over the course of his career. Uh, we didn't truly see, I don't think, Bryce Harper be super aggressive last year on the base pass from a stealing standpoint. Of course he was aggressive. He's always aggressive, sometimes annoyingly so. But could he add the steal back into his game if he feels more comfortable about comfortable about where his elbow's at this year, a year removed from Tommy John surgery recovery? That's possible. You can add a couple steals on there with a new pitch clock and everything. That Not new, but new to healthy Bryce Harper. And in a lineup where Trey Turner might be hitting better and uh, you're looking at potentially a change at the top of the line, I still think it'll be Schwarber, but – if Trey Turner's hitting better and he's right ahead of Bryce Harper, that's a great protection. If Nick Castellanos or JT Romuto or whoever's batting cleanup has a good year, that's great protection. This could be the best lineup Bryce Harper has ever played with in his career, and that helps him take the pressure off a little bit and also not be as much of a focal point. When I said the Phillies might have two MVP contenders, Trey Turner's the other one. So if Bryce Harper is healthy 
and plays the majority of the season. My thoughts on him winning MVP? Absolutely possible, but I can't say it's probable because of Acuna, Otani, Freeman, Betts, all the other great players in the National League. I'm sure there's a bunch of guys I'm not mentioning that people are going to get mad at me about not putting in that conversation. They're like there are some very good players out there. So MVP is a very tough, tough trophy to win. Could Bryce Harper do it again this year? Absolutely he could. And that's a great sign for the Philadelphia Phillies. Coming up as we wrap up, we got to go with the best number six in Philadelphia Phillies history. You know who I'm picking. Come on. I don't want to ruin the suspense, but I think you can nail down that it is another first baseman. I'll tell you who as we wrap up Locked On Phillies. Yeah, we were just talking about Bryce Harper, a power hitting first baseman with uh, top level defense. And now this guy probably didn't have gold glove caliber. Dude. Either way, he's probably the best first baseman, Bryce Harper, in franchise history since the guy that wore number six last, Ryan Howard. Ryan Howard's got to be the pick for best number six in Philadelphia Phillies franchise history. Just to tell you, I mean, he wore it from 2005 to 2016, 11 years. In that time, he had one of the greatest home run per season peaks in the history of baseball. Did it clean, too. Um, and no one's worn number six since that. There have been other Philadelphia Phillies legends where people have worn their number since, and then they've been retired. No one puts on number six, which should show you how people feel about Ryan Howard. I doubt that's just coincidence that in the – Eight years since he stopped wearing that number for the Phillies, and no one has put it on. There's some other uh, interesting names down here. Johnny Callison, a great player from 1960 to 1969. I'm taking Howard. I mean, the home run peak was one of the greatest things I've ever seen in the sport of baseball, not just for the Phillies. Like, as a clean player doing what Howard did, that's great. We also have some all-time names on this list uh, that – absolutely deserve to to be brought up in this conversation. Dick Sisler is the first one that, that I look at that. Uh, Granny Hamner, another great name. These guys are all from like the 40s. Skeeter Newsom, uh, Buster Adams, like a lot of great 1940s names that wore number six. I, I don't know why uh, that was the number that attracted it, but uh, when I look at it and like Tim McCarver wore the number from 1970 to 1972, I'm just trying to give love to other guys, but Ryan Howard is the clear choice for me here. You might call me biased because I watched him and he was one of my favorite athletes growing up. The funny thing about Ryan Howard, speaking of the MVP trophy, um, yeah, he's won it before at first base. And he's the last Phillies first baseman to win one. Could Bryce Harper be the next Philly to win an MVP trophy? Well, that is a question that will only be answered by his play this season. We're only six days away from starting to learn how that's going to look. Hopefully. Rain in the forecast for next Thursday. I've seen the comments on the YouTube videos. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. Let's have some positivity. Let's have some sunshine talk in the chat and hope that the Phillies will be able to play on opening day. But whatever the case, we're going to continue as if opening day is Thursday. We're going to continue episodes through the weekend as we've got some big storylines still to cover ahead of the start of the regular season. So that's all for today's episode of Locked on Phillies. Thank you so much for checking us out again. We're part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Please make sure you're rating, reviewing, and most importantly, subscribing to the YouTube. That really helps me out here on Locked On Phillies. So if you like the content, please subscribe. If you don't like the content, subscribe and go in the comments and tell me it stinks. Either way, if you subscribe, I'm happy, and I'll try to do a better job if you don't like it. But this has been fun, man. Hope you all have enjoyed the recent episodes we draw closer to opening day. Uh, that's all for today's episode, so I'll talk to you next time on the next episode of Locked On Phillies.